is happening next. It's I Kill You versus Viper. Stay tuned, guys. We'll be right back. You know your first opponent? Yeah, I am playing Viper. I don't want to like study on him and then probably try to read anything. I don't know his playstyle, but I know his decklist. In this terms, it's not worth it. You should just go by percentages, just go by decks. Everyone here is equal and prepared well. Also, I don't think that he is an advantage deck-wise. I'll just prepare to beat those decks. I can look at the decklist and then probably think of which ban I should do. They were here before, but somehow they managed to cope with the pressure and probably other players, uh, including me, should be able to do it as well. If I know I'm probably 45% or if I know I'm 55%, I still have to play the game and I cannot improve or disapprove that because the deck lists are made. It doesn't matter who I am playing, so if I want to advance, I want to beat everyone. Welcome back everyone to the second match of the day here at the European Summer Championship. I'm Raven, joining me to cast the game. It's going to be Saul. How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Always have a great time doing these events. Had a blast at America's last week, but of course I'm, I'm happy to be back on home turf, you know, casting, casting the region where the real players play, exactly. Europe as usual. Yeah, and we just see a, a crazy series already. George C winning 4-0, but we do have the next one coming up, which is going to be I Kill You versus Viper, and Whoa. we can see the classes. Straight off the bat, we have some pronunciation issues uh, here, Raven. I'm not known for that. <laughs> it's I kill you. Okay, this... every single time you say his name, that's happening now. All right, sold. Challenge given. Okay. Okay, so it's going to be these two players. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good start. Yeah, I know. So um, for me, at least, I kill you's uh, feeling like the favorite. I really like his lineup overall. Yeah, I agree. And uh, we are going to get straight into the first game. It's going to be I kill you's Hunter versus Viper's Dragon Control Warrior. And right off the bat, I am super excited to see this deck play out. This is a very unusual list. You know, it's Dragon Warrior. That's what you would uh, refer to it as straight away. But it's a controlling list. You see tools like Revenge, Bash. He has Brawls in there as well. But he's not running Shield Slam, which is, you know, classically considered one of the most powerful Control Warrior tools. And I personally am really excited to see this deck, um, whether it works for him or not, because over the last week or so, I've become a big fan of Bookworm and Nether Spite Historian in particular. I think mm -hmm. they're incredibly powerful cards, very well situated for the meta as well. It's just unfortunate that they're dragon cards and that the yeah. dragon package as a whole well, is not too powerful <laughs> overall. If you could just play them normally, so sure, they would be right. slightly too powerful. But I, I agree. And what's interesting to me is it feels like Viper's gone with the approach of there are the control elements, but I feel like this deck is like the pure value game. Yes. Like my minions are just going to be, because of the dragon synergies overall, better than yours. But I kill He's off to a pretty reasonable start with the kindly grandmother to begin the game with and into the huge toad and the wolf. So he's got everything he needs and even the high main there as his first draw going to be able to really put a lot of pressure on the warrior. Yep, and that is a really big deal that he got the resistant death rattle minion early on because that fiery war axe draw there from Viper, if it was just huge toad or King's Elec or something like that being developed, then it would have just immediately been smacked down for a tempo gain for Viper. So um, kindly grandmother, one of the Karazhan new additions to the game is a showing its worth here as just being a resistant minion that you can just use to build a flat uh, platform on that's just resistant to all removal. Yeah, and also the, the benefit here for Viper is the Bookworm, it, and this is the, the weird thing about sort of later game Dragon decks, is that the Bookworm doesn't feel great to have when you're opening hand, but it acts as an activator right. for all of your pre, like early Dragon Synergy cards. So we obviously saw the Alex Strazer champion be able to come out there oh, with the extra no. effect. So it's looking really good for him, and Bookworm can actually get a lot of work done against Hunter as well. Really does remove most of the uh, most of the minions outside of realistically high main and, and huffers knocking about. Yeah, so now this is an awkward point, and I spoke to Viper about this deck, and I was you know comparing it you know curve wise to the aggressive Dragon Warrior and saying what's the difference, and he says well the only turn where I really miss the curve that Dragon Warrior has is on turn three because I'm playing less options for that turn. I don't have the fierce monkeys, frothing berserkers, etc. So quite often I'm forced to just you know play War Axe on three or use Bash as a removal tool. So that's probably the kind of situation we're looking at here. Although you know, the Ravaging Ghoul is definitely not terrible, it allows him to pick up some decent trades on the board but um, gets immediately contested, whereas using the bash here allows him to just maintain dominance on the board, I guess, here with his Alex Strauss account. Yeah, the frustration is the Toad there, right? You know, if, yeah. if you just ghoul, then the Toad's still there and going to be able to trade extremely well. But now, Achilles is going to follow up with a pretty 
Uh, well, what appears to be a pretty straightforward turn, just dropping the wolf and continuing with the pressure. And gonna just ask Viper if he can keep up, because this kindly grandmother is still, you know, even though it's just just a one-one for now, because the death rattle's not proc, it's still chipping away, and he's always a target for cards like Hell Master. It's a kill command activator, and just a general nuisance for the warrior to deal with. Yeah, now double bookworm in hand for Viper. So his first bookworm is now at least activated by the second, but this really is probably not the matchup you're targeting Bookworm at. There's a lot of great meta targets for Bookworm in the game right now. You know, Thunder Bluff Valiant in Shaman, for example. So mm. many more people playing mid-range Shaman. And in that deck, even if you don't hit the Thunder Bluff Valiant, there's, there's Totem Golems, <laughs> there's Tuscar Totemic, there's Manatide Totems, you know, there's all these fantastic targets. You know, Flame Wakers in Tempo Mage, um, Fandral, Staghelm, and Violet Teachers against Druid. But Hunter, eh, not so much. Most of their low, uh, low attack minions have Death Rattles so it's not a clean removal for the bookworm. So a little bit awkward for him to have both in hand here, but he does pick up a really strong clear this turn with the Ravaging Ghoul. Yeah, and I really, although, you know, this is going to stop him being able to coin into one of the bookworms next turn, I really like the ghoul play over the revenge here because it means you have a minion on the board when the hunter doesn't, and then that means you can just, it makes your trades going forward so much easier. Yeah, hunter is not a great deck at tempo swinging, right? If you can, they are basically forced to build a platform and then snowball. They're not, if they fall behind, they don't really have great tools to catch themselves up, but you can see in I Kill You's hand right now, he has the quick shot. Uh, oh. In, in Aikili's hand right now, he has the quick shot, but he can't follow that up with an additional minion because it's too mana restrictive for him to drop the Infested Wolf here. So I'm actually curious about him going for the, the quick shot play here because the Infested Wolf is just a little bit more mana efficient and it kind of contests the board quite nicely. You still have the Death Rattle effect left over at the end. So interesting that he chose to just, you know, take the quick shot pass turn there. But I guess his thinking is, look at my hand. High main into double Call of the Wild. I will go late game against this control deck. Yeah, I completely agree. That is going to be the key. Just to open up the board to just slamming a high main on there and really putting Viper under a lot of pressure. Because as we mentioned earlier, the although there's, a, you know, a good amount of removal tools in this Dragon Warrior deck, that isn't the shield slams to, you know, for the ease of just killing off a, at least the first stage of a high main there. And Deathwing in Viper's hand, that is going to be nice to try and reset after a Call of the Wild if it gets to that point, though, because I feel like I Kill You is going to be able to just put so much pressure on now, being able to really turn up the heat onto Viper. I'm going to be honest, these bookworms are looking a little <laughs> stupid right now. <laughs> They, they do not contest this current situation particularly particularly well at all. And the hits just absolutely keep on coming from I kill you. There is just going to be pressure into pressure into pressure following up. He has a decent turn next turn, whether he wants to push damage with the hero power alongside the infested wolf or just develop the huge toad and then straight into back to back Call of the Wild. This is going to be so much pressure for Viper to dig his way through. Yeah, and we already see the benefit of Aiku choosing to kill off the ghoul because then he would have been able to actually clear off the first part of the high main and use a bookworm and like, you know, present that minion onto the board as a real threat. So. Well, he would have had the Infested Wolf developed on the board instead. So the 3-3 the three, three could have still traded true, and he'd true. have had the 1-1s one left over, yeah. um, which was my question. But, you know, like, like, like we pointed out, he's basically just saying, you know, I'm fine with taking one slow turn here because the power of my follow-up turns is so huge. And now, now Bookworm gets his moment in the sun. <laughs> MVP Bookworm, because Rhino is an extremely scary minion giving all beasts charge while it's on the board. And when, when, it, when someone plays a Rhino before turn eight, you are very, very afraid. You're afraid of Call of the Wild anyway, but when the whole all three of them can charge, that's, here's, that's when games end. Here's the problem, though. Viper's turn on the previous turn, he played the Ravaging Ghoul preemptively to set up a revenge on the following turn, very much with this card, Call of the Wild, in mind. So he wanted to remove those two 2-1s two on the board to prevent this extra charging damage coming in. But because that Tundra Rhino was played, suddenly his priorities had to change. He yeah. had to get rid of the Tundra Rhino, and the extra damage being pushed with the Hyenas here is just now put him in a lethal position which he is in serious trouble. Does now have the three damage revenge available to him, though, alongside Bookworm number two. He's going to go shield block instead, try and pick up some life gain here. I'm sure the revenge is getting used. Slam is a very nice pickup in this situation. Yeah, that's actually perfect, because if he actually went for just the revenge second Bookworm to clear up the board, then he's on seven damage versus yeah. Hunter. It's, yeah. too, it's too much to try and come back from. So really, really good pickup for Viper there. It means he can clear the board whilst gaining the additional armor to give him a bit of breathing room. But I really like this play as well. You don't need to just slam 
Call of the Wild. I much prefer just building the board up again, and anything that survives just makes you follow up Call of the Wild and Hero Power that much stronger. Fair point. Uh, he does skip damage on this turn. Uh, you know, it, it, the the merit of like not playing Call of the Wild to an extent is also that you have the opportunity to press Hero Power on that turn if you want to. Uh, but he does also skip the Hero Power this way. But like you said, he's developing sticky minions that can benefit in the next turns from the Call of the Wild, and that is not the Nether Spite we were looking for. No. If the if this was a completely different game of Hearthstone, there was a chance of going Deathwing into Deathwing, mm. which is kind of hilarious. But I imagine Viper will not actually have the time to even think about pulling that combo off. Somewhere in the back room, Brian Kibler is giddy with excitement at that very thought, but this is not going to be that game, I don't think. And I like the way the other two choices are actually like mirrors of each other. The two drakes that gain attack or health based off hand size. So that's something you see every day. He's going to go for it again. Chillmore would have been with the, the big pickup off the first one, but now he doesn't have the mana available, but he's still going to pick it up, try and use it as a defensive option on a following turn forced to take a pretty miserable looking double trade into the uh, into the infested wolf and now at 14 life there is six with That's call of the right. wild adding seven plus a hero power that is just gonna be game and this dragon deck from viper is uh, gonna have his work cut out for him its first test has been failed so this guy who's brought some really unusual lists to the tournament in general is still gonna have to prove their worth yeah, really, um, really strong game there from I Kill You, and he just outpaced Viper, you know, to, to quite dramatic extents. There was never a stage in which Viper was ahead on the board or even particularly felt comfortable. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and like I said, this is a guy who's brought some really interesting tech choices in his lineup. You know, he has Rogue with Violet Illusionist, for example, so playing some very unusual stuff, and when you do take those, those risky deck building decisions and bring them to tournament, you know the pressure's on you to prove that your decks work. And like I said, the first test has been failed there by the Dragon Warrior. Yep, so we are going to go to a very short break while, uh, before we continue this series. So stick around, guys, and we'll be back soon. Well, first of all, I would like to say it's really rewarding to be here and participate in such event. It's really rewarding as well because I was so close uh, to advancing to so many other events uh, like IEM Katowice, like Biogame, Gfinity. I had a few obstacles uh, getting here, but with the support from Blizzard and the family, uh, I managed to overcome them and I'm happy to be here and compete on, the, on this stage. It's, I feel awesome. So what sort of motivates you to keep trying to qualify? Well, I guess I had to finally do it. <laughs> well, to use his lava okay. burst and book his ticket. Congratulations. I like competition. After getting Legend, there were not that many challenges in Hearthstone, so I started playing uh, competitively in tournaments, then uh, working hard on ladder. When I failed getting to the other events, it just motivated me even more to do my best and try even harder to get to that. Talk to me about the championship tour in general. I love that everyone is equal. Uh, nobody is awarded something for nothing. And if you are working hard uh, and you are really uh, like committed to the game, you can also compete. And maybe next preliminaries, it might be you who will be competing in this tournament. Might be me. Uh, or maybe might not you, me. but. <laughs> Really impressive, the sheer persistence from I Kill You. I was speaking to him yesterday, and he's like, yeah, I've been playing pretty much since early beta. Just been working away, working yeah. away, and getting so close so often. Right. And this time, you know, this is the chance, right? Yeah, I mean, he he's a player that I've personally run into when I was playing competitively, you know, in qualifiers, just online on ladder, in open tournaments, etc. And he's a player that... I'm sure you'll echo. We've both heard a lot about from a certain member of the Polish casting community who uh, likes to big up his boys a little bit. You know, Nimsch does a lot of work in trying to promote the Polish community. Mm -hmm. And I kill you is one of the players that we have heard a lot about. And it is great for me to personally be up close and personal with him now and give him an opportunity to, to show what he's worth. And he's making a very strong impact so far. Yeah, he's off to a great start. As we get into game two, it's going to be I kill you's Druid versus Viper's Warrior again. So Viper sticking to the Warrior and just trying to, you know, get the win with this deck. Because I think when when you look at player lines ups overall, I very quickly make a decision on what's the, the hurdle deck. You know, the one he has to mm. get a win with and then feel really good about the rest of the series. And I feel like the Warrior is the one for him here. 
I think there's a couple of questions that need answering. I mean, there's there's the the Dragon Warrior unconventional list, and I mentioned you know just before we we went to the, the to the video packages, which was Rogue is such a weird list. Like Violet Illusionist yeah. in his Rogue instead of some of the win condition cards like like Questing Adventure that we've seen. So he definitely has some some questions that need answering about his lineup. But Ikeliu is going with the more standard lineup here with the the Malagos Druid here. Although his list is also a little bit unusual. He's not. Not running Auctioneer, he's playing one Maya Keeper, he has Ancient of Wars, and he still has room for the, the three heals, the two Feral Rages and the Moonglade Portal in the list, so a pretty unconventional build himself. Yeah, just being able to squeeze it all in and be a little bit more defensive, and th this matchup generally, if we're going to call this deck sort of Control Warrior, right. um, normally is very difficult for the Druid to actually win, but, you know, as we saw, this isn't the conventional list at all, it's very minion based, and I feel like I, I Kill You may have a much better trance uh, with this list because there's not going to be uh, the the removal that's very lined up with the druid minions right you know with no shield slams these arcane giants are going to be very difficult to deal with it's true you know i i, I spoke at length uh, with viper about this deck in particular because it's so unusual and he's you know basically of the opinion that because the deck is minion based he's not going to spend as much time armoring up so to his, to, in his opinion, the Shield Slam is a, a win more card. That's the way he put it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if he, he was in a position where he got to gain a bunch of armor with this deck anyway, he'd be in such a comfortable position because he'd also have minions on the board. He doesn't really need the Shield Slam. Um, so I'm wondering if this deck might have a little bit of a, of a stronger matchup even against this uh, the Malagos Druid because you can actually pressure them at the same time as gaining all the armor through Justicar True Heart and the Shield Blocks, etc. Yeah, it definitely shifts the battle plan for the Druid because sure. you know we were talking about this Druid list as we could see the, the Nourish come down there with the second Nourish available to I Kill You as well to really fill up his hand going forward. But we talk about the, the way this Druid deck seems to have to really alter its battle plan depending on matchup. There's not really a clear defined way to win a, a, across the board against everything. And again, this is going to be more, you know, minion removal and trying to sort of stay alive as opposed to really put the pressure on the warrior. So now with Viper drawing the bookworm for on curve next turn, Viper will be sat there saying, please, Play a Fandral turn, see what happens. <laughs> Just try it, but unfortunately, no such luck. Ancient of War coming comes down, and with no execute in sight, Viper is going to have to go through this the hard way. But as I said, Viper, you know, set this deck up to me to say that I don't need as many removal tools in this deck because I can use my minions as removal when I need them. And sure, this is a, an, un, uh, a, an unattractive trade for Viper here, but still, he's able to deal with this Ancient of War on the board because he's actually generated minion pressure in the early game. Yeah, exactly. That. Unattractive, but doable. Definitely doable. And we see the power of the Nether Spike there. Just discover a legendary dragon, it feels yep. like, most of the time. And what do you even pick here? So many options although I feel like Anixia is the safest. Anixia is, is definitely a big deal. Chromagus can be combined with Slam, Ooh. though. That's actually a combo that Viper talked about to me when we are talking oh, about really? the deck as well. Yeah. He's so planned for this. I was actually, <laughs> yeah, expecting to see the Chromagus there because he definitely pointed that out as one of the big dragons that he does like to discover. And uh, we were talking about, you know, just Nether Spite historian stats in general. I think there's 20 possible dragons you can discover, just uh, neutrals if you don't have the yep. class dragons. And you know, seven or eight of them are just these huge legendaries. So you just, you get so much value generated with that, that simple two mana card. Yeah, and uh, you know, on a scale of one to ten, how much are you wanting to see Bookworm do work this oh, game? I want so. it. I want it. <laughs> I want it so very bad. But he's just not going to draw the Fandral. He's just going to tease me with it the entire game. So we can see that Viper's game plan overall is, seems to be doing pretty well, keeping the pressure up and keeping the minions on the board. Yeah. I Kill You has a couple of options. The Moonglade Portal could heal him up and really get some of those powerful minions on the on the six drop. It's crazy. Like Ken and Sylvanas being the two that really scream out as the, the ones you would really like, or oh, like even a high main at some point. Yeah, he doesn't really have a clean way to react to this board right now. Moonglade Portal just feels a little bit slow based on what you're facing down. You know, quite often your six drop minion has five health. That's actually a very, very common outcome. And five health is pretty easy for your opponent to deal with right now. Um, so I feel like this might just be a draw your deck turn. Um, just, you know, be, be willing to play from behind here for one more turn, but uh, that is a lot of pressure still coming on the board, so I can understand I kill you just wanting to go for the Emperor turn, but yeah, I mean, it looks like that is very directly <laughs> the two choices he is trying to choose from. 
decides on the Emperor in the end. I definitely can't blame him. You know, this is a little bit of a panic switch from his perspective. This isn't the ideal scenario that he would like to Emperor in in this matchup, but ju just feels like he needs to try and fight back on the board a little bit. Yeah, I mean, just look at the hand. Like, that is not a hand you really want to Emperor at right. all. It's more just playing it as, as the minion more than anything. He's going to be able to get a pretty nice slam off there, just going for the three damage. He could have cleared the, uh, the Emperor anyway, who's going to use the weapon, but he does remove the potential he later combo of Chromaga Slam. He does, and he also could have protected his life total just a little bit there by uh, using the Ravaging Ghoul instead on that turn and trading in with the 1-3 and not face tanking the five damage with his weapon, which, you know, from Viper's perspective, his opponent has just emperored a big hand, yeah. right? So there is some some serious potential burst damage coming out over the next couple of turns, but he uh, doesn't feel too uh, insecure with the amount of life gain in his hand that he oh. has just from that Justicar True Heart, and that is not too bad. And Bolf is uh, a pretty poor outcome, honestly. Yeah. He's got to say our, our friend from prelims. Yes, <laughs> indeed. I'd, suddenly, I just feel like Savitz should be casting this game because. <laughs> Let's go. Let's switch out. He knows, he knows more about both Ram Shield than any man alive, I'm sure. <laughs> the Fell Spirit going to be used there. Sorry, the Fell Rage. Uh, that's the second time I've done that today to actually clear up the SCR Drake. So, not looking too bad. Look both, both takes the damage. <laughs> why not? The card's so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see it, apart from that one situation that you referred to in prelims where it was yeah. shift, to Zerif in, in, shift to Zerus, sorry, <laughs> into both Ram Shield, easy for me to say. Um, I mean, let's let's just hey, bookworm it. I was right? going to say, Sol, you got your chance. <laughs> bookworm is an option here, and it looks like a pretty nice one to effectively just deal five damage to both there and clear him off the board and I'm, stop any confusion that can arise with this minion. I'm real. I mean, do you bookworm it? Because the, the worst thing that could happen is that you bookworm this minion, which is essentially just a free kill over the course of the game, right? You can hit face what? and Bolf takes the damage. For those of you not familiar with how it works, like you can kill Bolf with minion trades without taking any damage on your minions themselves. That's what makes the card so poor. So do you really need to use a premium removal card like Bookworm here to take care of it when you'd much rather hold that back for Fandral, for example? Yeah, the the only thing I'd think about here is, you know, what if what if Fandral never gets played? Sure. Whereas you drop in a 3-6 on the board that totally the Druid's going to struggle to deal with. The other option as well was just a car, which just starts to get your armor rolling. Well, the other option was just slam Chromagus. How does Druid deal with a 6-8, even with that 3-power bolf on board, right? It's, it's a pretty rough turn for them to be able to deal with it. Yeah, and, and the just a car can just get cleaned up very easily as well, which yeah. is the problem. You gain the armor, but... You, uh, you know, as you said, Viper's not really planning on, you know, out armoring the opponent in this game. He's just going to pressure him. So I, I don't mind the bookworm at all here. Yeah, I'm totally fine with it. I mean, Chromagus, from the other perspective, he can if he can get Chromagus down on a clear board, then the question just seriously yeah. becomes, how does Druid deal with this? So I can totally buy it. It's just, uh, you know, both just... It seems like a minion that you don't want to waste actual cards on, right? You just feel so unimpressed by both that you're just like, oh, I'm just going to deal with this whenever. But sure, like you said, just developing a 3-6 on the board, perfectly fine. And Bolf is going to be very upset after this series since you've just completely sorry, ru yeah, I've just ruined him. I've just assassinated his character. I'm sorry, Bolf. He's probably just a nice guy. I'm not sure if Savitz will ever talk to me again. <laughs> Yeah, they'll talk about you. Though. Hey, at least I've spent the whole series talking about how much I like dragons now. So mate, I'm, probably <laughs> I'm probably friends with Kibler again, at least. Yeah, lost one, gained another, yeah, right? Solid. You've, you've come out even after this. Okay, so with the Innovate as well, it's going to help out get uh, help get out the Arcane Giants, which I feel like was one of the drawbacks of I Kill You's hand over the, the past few turns, having the big impact cards, but not playing enough spells so far right. in the game to actually get them going, because... Arcane Giant's great, but when you play it for six or seven mana, it feels so much like less impact on the turn, especially when you're already behind on board. Yep, there is one execute in hand here, but you know, this this is one of those situations where you have to beg the question, could one of these cards be a shield slam? Because <laughs> Then suddenly we're looking at a potentially pretty strong turn uh, to be able to eliminate these uh, a lot more efficiently. But still, one execute, nothing to sniff at here. Can take out one of the A8s pretty tidily and then uh, just has to solve the problem of dealing with the other one. Yeah, and the, pro uh, the thing is he kind of has to deal with them both as well because you could just die next turn. 
Um, Again, yeah, the hand has been emperored. So, yeah. Uh, you know, discounted Malagos, discounted Living Roots, you know, all of these things are in and, your opponent's range. And there's also as well, like, you know, if Viper's actually been tracking the, you know, where their cards are in the hand, yeah. those Moonfires have been in hand for a long time. They like are the very only long two time. cards yeah. left that have been emperored, though, which, you know, lo looks weird to us because it looks like there's no discounted cards left in the hand. But, of course, from Viper's perspective, if he is keeping track, he'll know that just those two cards on the left-hand side have been discounted. Yeah. Looks like just Chromagus here to try and contest the 8-8 in a, in a weird sense, you know, at least incentivize the trade. And that way he has tools to clear up next turn with, you know, things like Ravaging Ghoul and Revenge. But yeah, the, the lack of spot removal in this deck possibly coming back to Bite Viper here. And that is 12 damage from hand with the two Moonfires and the Malagos plus the 8 from the Arcane Giant. So not quite there yet for I Kill You, but he might just be considering just outright making a push here and just deciding that it's face time. Well, well, that's the thing, isn't it? Both players are kind of on edge a little bit because both players are very much in range of just dying the following turn. Yeah. So I feel like for my kill you, he needs to just go for it. He has Feral Rage and Swipe. So you could just bank that damage now and then you know build into the Maligo's turn to follow up and try and you know, really cash in on the fact that the second Arcane Giant wasn't dealt with. But he has gone with the more conservative play and actually just killed off the Chromagus. Didn't want any crazy shenanigans coming out from the multiple card draw for Viper. Yep, so I kill you does blink, but if he had left that board up and hadn't hero powered the, the six power plus the three and then Gromash and Revenge, that would have been enough to seal the game. He's he's actually still not far off because of the Fiery War Axe attack he has as well, but is going to have to find some way to address this board. And with a couple of Whirlwind effects in his hand, he is able to do that quite effectively. The The problem with using both of the Whirlwind effects here, the Revenge and the, the Ravaging Ghoul, is that he's going to lose his Bookworm in the process to the to the trade into one of the Drakes. Yeah, definitely worthwhile, though, because, again, suddenly with yeah, very few minions... <laughs> I have a spare Chromagus! <laughs> Again, yep. <laughs> this Chromagus will double draw a card at some point in this matchup. That is Viper's grand plan. But uh, as I was saying, the you know suddenly with no minions on the board, Maligos has a much bigger ask to be able to just kill him there. So Viper's just securing his position, and with you know a flurry of extremely high value cards in hand, he can just do what he wants next turn. This Raven Idol could be huge for Aikil you here. No, no more burn that can be combined with Malagos. Does pick up a Nourish though, which is never the worst thing in the world. This deck, uh, when the with the Malagos strategy in the Druid deck, it, it becomes much more focused on drawing your deck every yeah. game. You know, that's why a lot of players are including Gadgetan Auctioneer in the list, whereas. You know, a lot of the time with the, the, the more token built list, you'd see people nourishing for mana much more often because, you know, Ancient of Wars, Wisps of the Old Gods, all of these powerful combinations that you had. Whereas, you know, this deck just, you want to draw 30 cards game after game after game if you can. So anytime you can pick up a nourish, not a bad feeling, but I'm sure I kill you would have been loving the possibility of a, an extra Living Roots or Moonfire there. Yeah, it would have been kind of insane and really opened up the sort of levels of health he can deal with from Viper. But we do seem to go a bit wider on the board with a Mire Keeper. No need to ramp when you're already on 10 mana. And Sol, there's your favorite card again. Sweet, sweet Bookworm. Just in time for the Mire Keeper as well. Yeah, it's not a bad target. It can take out the 3-3, three, three, but that would be his entire turn in this situation. Yes, he gets to address a 3-3, three, three, but the, you know, the, the level of drop-off in power of the minion that he's developing for the cost of doing that is pretty severe in this situation. Uh, so I wouldn't be too surprised to see him go with uh, with Grom or Chromagus here. Instead. I was just going to say Chromagus. Yeah. He loves that card, clearly. Yeah. And it wouldn't be too bad as well, because at the moment, the, the Justicar kind of has the same issue with, although you gain the armor, it's easily dealt with the following turn. Yeah. Did choose to go for Grom, though, and just present quite a lot of damage for I kill you to really think about this turn. And again, you know, Druid kind of struggles with the you know big minion removal, because there's not that many Druids even playing Mulch anymore. Nope. Uh, generally, unless they pick up a you know a big spot removal from a Raven Idol these days, then uh, big minions are an absolute nightmare for Druid to deal with. This was historically the case. This is why pretty much every Druid deck was running uh, Big Game Hunter back in the three mana days. They just had no good tools to deal with these big minions. And Mulch for a while filled that role that Big Game Hunter was filling after it got nerfed. And uh, now most they've, they've kind of just gone back to cutting out the Mulches again. So. Um, I kill you does draw there with the nourish and straight away you can see the power of filling up his hand because now that is some serious burst damage coming from Malagos and has the the swipe to clear out the the Gromash. Uh, what would you have thought about the innovate foul rage that turn? Uh, to face. Yeah. Uh, so there are 15, so 15, 17, 18, 19 damage in hand from Malagos. So you're not setting up lethal yeah. with it, right? So I don't 
really see the point. It's always good to go face, though. It does always <laughs> feel good to go face, and that's definitely, you know, I've been playing a ton of this deck, the Malagos Druid, over the last couple of days, and it's a play that I've seriously found myself making a lot, you know, just swipe face, ignore your board, Feral Rage face, ignore your board, you know, sometimes that, that is the push that you need to make, but in that situation, it just didn't really get a lot done, I don't think. Oh, is this going to just be a Yogg turn? I kill you, just hovering over it, just be, just playing with us. It's one of the, the general ideas in this matchup is you play your Maligos, all of your burn, then follow up with Yogg just to guarantee that Yogg doesn't do anything stupid with your hand like a, a mainly Ancestral Communion. But let's see what Yogg is going to do as the Thought Steel picks up Mind Control. Okay, got the sure. good one. Everything, everything's coming up Millhouse so far, but uh, Divine Strength, yeah, that hits the right target as oh, well. Mind Blast that, is beautiful. Yeah, that, that is, is so big. Right up his alley right now. Flame Strike irrelevant. Oh. Mind Blast number two! This is a pretty absurd looking Yogg oh. so far. <laughs> okay. That is kind of nuts. And that is just hit. Wow. That is actually just one of the best Yogg's I've ever seen. I, I would not go that far. No, in, in terms of like the game plan overall, the, sure. the double I, Mind Blast sure. and creating a sure. huge Yogg is, is kind of crazy. The crazy thing here is as well is that the secret is, is Catrick. So. If Shield Block is cast here for a defensive tool to try and you know pull up, pull out of range for Viper, that damage that he gains from the Shield Block is basically immediately Negated, swept yeah. away by the Catrick appearing. So this is going to be a difficult situation to navigate it, his way out of for Viper. Is it? There's one card on the far left that, lo that looks reasonable. I mean, if he Deathwings, he's dead to Malagos, right? Yeah, he doesn't know that though. I think he's within his rights to know that. Based True, on I mean, I, I two, two Emperor cards being held the entire game, and basically I kill you's entire deck I was being in his say, hand he's right got now. Most so of his deck by now. I, I definitely don't blame him trying to find an alternate line here. I think he was drawing exactly for his second execute to try and be able to gain some more life and get out of range that way, but just not going to be good enough. And the second test, the second port of call for this unusual dragon deck has been failed as well. And we're going to see Malagos come down here. It's going to be a 2-0 lead for the journeyman uh, Polish player here. And Viper has a long way to come back into this game. Yeah, definitely a rough game for Viper. Just everything just wasn't quite enough. He had a decent start putting the pressure on. But as we said, that Yogg really flipped things around and opened up the Malagos kill from I Kill You. So pretty reasonable in terms of his name. Yeah, I mean, you you were thinking about Feral Rage Face the turn before, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're in that world, if you're thinking about damage, a double Mind Blast Yog that puts a 12 power dude on the board, pretty solid. Yep. So I kill you is currently 2-0 up, but we'll be right back with the next game. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> Do you have any people that you practice with? Uh, it's kind of still the same as on prelims because I'm pretty new to playing competitively. Like started probably at March, April. No one knows me and I don't know anyone either. And it's pretty much not my way of doing stuff that I just randomly go into someone's stream and then write, hey man, you want to practice with me? And like people have to be like, who is this guy? Do you think that gives you maybe an advantage? Probably a like, really small advantage. Like maybe people don't expect some plays or some line of plays of me. Don't expect me to be thinking in a special way, probably. What makes Hearthstone uh, different from, say, some of the competitive games you might have played in the past? The biggest difference is like Hearthstone, you play it on uh, a PC. Like, you cannot shuffle the cards you draw, so your opponent always knows the order in which you've drawn the cards. It really does matter sometimes, so you can, like, read your opponent. Like, that's not possible in other games. What keeps you motivated to keep getting better? I really love um, challenges, I really love winning stuff and doing good in tournaments and, like, matches and so on. So that's the way I started playing games, because I can challenge people and just continue to playing hard soon. Viper's definitely got a challenge ahead of him so far. He's actually 0-2 down versus I Kill You. Had two shots with the Dragon Warrior so far, and uh, both missed, although that second game was actually really close. It was, yeah. It definitely could have come down to the wire, uh, or definitely did come down to the wire, sorry. But yeah, interesting looking at uh, that, that interview there where he does seem to be a bit of a lone wolf, right? Mm. And that is 
a very solid explanation for why he's not really conforming to the norm in terms of ways that you build these decks. You know, the, the unusual Dragon Control Warrior, the unusual Rogue deck that I talked about before, you know, packing the Violet Illusionist. So, yeah, I mean, if you're not really part of, you know, any of the core practice groups of the professional Hearthstone scene, then you know, that goes to a long way to explain why, you know, your way of thinking is a little bit different. And uh, it's up to Viper here to, to prove that his way of thinking is uh, going to be good enough to get him through this tournament. Yeah, we are starting game three, and Viper has seemed to bailed out on his warrior for now at least and he's gonna lock in the freeze mage versus i kill you's rogue yeah and definitely a little bit of a resurgence in in freeze mage over these these last couple of weekends freeze mage didn't didn't perform overly well in uh, america's championship but again some players here definitely had a lot of faith in it and i feel like a lot of the meta calls have been dictated by the presence of freeze mage to an extent because you know you'd have to look at Two of the players who are favorites for this tournament, George C and Dr. Hippie, mm -hmm. uh, were heavily expected to bring Freeze Mage. Whether they did or not is a story we'll get to a little bit later on, but uh, Viper, another one who's fallen down that Freeze Mage route. So it's interesting to see whether he gets caught in some of the counters that people have brought expecting Freeze Mage, such as all the control warriors that we're seeing. Yeah, it's really difficult as well, because when you, you come to a tournament and you, you know there's a few Freeze Mage players knocking around, yeah. you kind of don't just want to hand them a, almost a free win, right? right. So, you know, definitely Definitely a thought process into that as this is just an eight man. It's, uh, you know, there's not too many players to consider. So, yeah, we'll see how it turns out. And Viper getting off to a pretty reasonable start there. The Arcane Intellect just being able to start cycling through the deck as it's pretty much what Freeze Mage needs to do to be able to set up those very sort of regimented, I will finish the game in, in two to three turns. Yeah, and he has found himself a strong matchup here with the Freeze Mage. You know, Miracle Rogue variations are classically not very effective against mm. Freeze Mage because... They are combo decks that are so finely tuned to try and kill an opponent once. That, yeah. is, that is what the goal is. It's draw your deck and then, you know, your deck reaches critical mass of the, part, of the point where your opponent just cannot survive one push of burst damage. But uh, Freeze Mage, of course, asks you to kill them three times over the course of the game, plus any healing or it freezes that you have to bust your way through. But this new variation that people are running yeah. with Questing Adventurers does have the potential to at least come up with you know persistent board pressure and tempo throughout the course of the game and actually beat down freeze mage in a way that a lot of the the favored decks against it are able to do yeah and i was actually sat with Akil yesterday we were playing some rogue and it what really impressed me and he, he said he's basically play, played rogue variants since early beta so he, right. just, he loves the class <laughs> yeah and he, you could tell because he very quickly identifies how he needs to win any given game, like very quick, and just goes all in on it. He doesn't really, you know, try and cut any corners or like go halfway into a strategy. He just goes all in with what he knows he needs to do. If he wins, he wins, and if it's not enough, it's not. And I feel like, especially in this matchup, you kind of have to do that. Yeah, I was going to say, that is really promising for his chances with this particular variation, because this variation, more so than any, often relies on, all right, I'm all in. Like, you know, yeah. you're questing prep of this conceal, go. I'm going to cold blood this and hit you for 18 next turn, right? Like, quite often and you And that happened to multiple that times yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that's it's what the deck is built to do. But yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. definitely positive for Ikeel to use chances in this matchup that he's able to identify those situations. But he's still a little way away from generating that, that win condition just yet. But he does at least have the Gadgetan Auctioneer and conceal uh, tool in his hand that he can use to at least draw into his deck, but it's not the amount of pressure that a concealed questing adventurer is. Yeah, and Viper there just choosing to clear off the Tomb Pillager. Just doesn't want to just give him five, you know, take five damage the next turn for free, but does give I kill you the coin, which means he's been able to go straight into Azure Drake and really help out just with his curve in general, as now with two gadget Zans, as you said, the prep conceal and now backstab, there's you know quite a lot of work he can do in the next couple of turns. Sure is, and this mirror image in hand here for Viper is going to be uh, an, aw an awkward card to time. You know, we were talking about the inclusion of mirror image in Freeze Mage recently, and you know how the timing of it is so key, right? It's a very high skill cap card because you want to play it. You know, if you're not using it to protect a Doomsayer, if you're just playing it to prevent damage on board, you want to time it at the point where you prevent maximum damage. Mm -hmm. So, for example, turn five against Hunter. Because on turn six they want to develop a high main, and then they, you know, so they just put these huge chunky minions down. You have these zero two taunts on the board. So 
finding a situation where it will prevent the most damage against rogues specifically is a really complex calculation because you have to take things like fan of knives into consideration you have to try and predict what minions are coming down and when so and even the problem of cards like cold blood you know you, right. could, you could just get you know double cold blood from a minion you weren't expecting there's suddenly so much damage just banked for the rogue but really nice cleanup of the Azure Drake there using the Thanos and actually cycling a Roaring Torch into the deck, which is going to be pretty key as we've seen Viper actually use up some of his burn already in the form of that Fireball. Yeah, this is a big whiff turn from, from Aikilu here, which makes me question the, the choice of the Coin Drake earlier. I, I can understand him wanting to keep up consistent pressure, but just his, his curve management seems a little bit questionable when he, you know, he had those two Auctioneers in hand and coining out the Tomb Pillager, you know, 100% fine. It, it replaces the coin in your hand, but from there, using the coin just to go through to Drake and leaving himself with this potential whiff turn here, you know, potentially he could have you know, this turn already, we could have seen Coin, Gadgetzan, Backstab, Preparation, Conceal, for example, and he'd have a huge chunk of his deck in his hand right now. Yeah, I do understand wanting to just keep the pressure on, though, sure. as well. Yeah, because, totally buy it. you know, the second the Drake doesn't die, then you can start really cashing out on the spell power and then just really, you know, continue on with some powerful turns. But yeah, did get punished for it in the end, and Emperor's going to come down for Viper on a... It's a pretty reasonable Emperor hitting the two Frost Bolts, uh, the, and the Ice Block is kind of nice, because it means whenever Ice Block gets Emperor at least once, you can really squeeze it into turns a lot easier as well. It's also worth noting that he left the Blood Mage Thanos up on the board on the previous turn instead of being, uh, choosing to hit it with the Dagger, which uh, does two things. You know, first off, you're going into your opponent's Emperor turn, so don't give them the extra draw to hit their Emperor. Secondly, if there was no minion being developed by the Freeze Mage, which is very possible, then that Blood Mage is still on the board as a backstab target as you're going into your Gadgetzan turn. So, uh, very, very small micro play there from IQU, but you know, really, really strong understanding of matchup considerations. Yeah, it's exactly what you need to do to win a game like right. this, right? We did see a nice clean kill onto the Emperor as well as the Thanos. And the Gadgetzan's alive. And after seeing two burn spells already come out for minion removal from Viper, he's got to be feeling at least half confident the Gadgetzan could live. And even if not, he's got the follow-up of the second one next turn. Yeah, so now Viper has to uh, make this the sad, sad consideration of whether he really needs to uh, Frostbolt ping or Fireball this Gadgetzan Auctioneer because he's, he's already fast approaching the point where he's building up the burn himself in hand, so he doesn't really want to break up too much of it. But there's certain threats which, even as a Freeze Mage, when you feel like you have such a, a linear win condition in your deck, it really is not that linear. You have to adjust to situations like this and ration out your burn to just extend the game even longer, therefore, you know, draw even more burn as well as the Alexstrasza that you need to, to get the whole thing going. Yeah, and also, you know, Gadget Zan's one of the cards that could actually really push I kill your head in this game. Absolutely, so, you yeah. know, you, you, if it was almost any other minion, it would just be freeze, move on, you know, for a turn and then carry on like that. But with Gadget Zan, you just can't leave it up because it could really, really swing the matchup against you. It's interesting, Viper there could have had the potential to at least try and protect the Loot Hoarder on board from the, from the dagger hit and you know leave it to attack on its own initiative into a minion that's played by playing the Zero Mana Mirror Images alongside it. And we, we talked about timing this card earlier and he, he chose to hold onto it there even for the Zero Mana. So definitely has some, uh, some specific plans in mind for this card. Yeah, I can imagine those plans potentially revolve around a card called Leroy or Quest Adventure yeah, or, yeah, or just Van Cleef. Walling yeah. out a questing adventure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So the second Gadget Zan does come out with the Conceal as well. Perhaps drawn, but I imagine it's going to be held on to this turn. Although I kill you is just sitting, thinking about what he could possibly do. But it doesn't really gain him too much to just prep Shiv out of nowhere just for the cycle when he could potentially build up one of those huge Van Cleefs next turn. And that's, again, just another way you can really get ahead in this game. If you put a massive minion on the board, Freeze Mage doesn't normally do too well at dealing with them. Yeah, and Viper does have a copy of Flame Strike in his Freeze Mage deck. Not all do. Of course, this tournament, the, the deck lists are revealed to your opponent and, in fact, all the players in the tournament as a whole. So, you know, I kill you will be knowing that there is an out to deal with this Concealed Auctioneer here, but it's only a single copy in the deck and it would be his opponent's entire turn, essentially. So very, very willing to take the risk here with the Conceal and gets paid out for it as the Flame Strike is not in hand for Viper. And right, now we're going to see the speed in which Viper will play with this Auctioneer, because I feel like that's a lot, lot to uh, suffer from. I've seen some players in the past that aren't used to uh, Auctioneer decks in terms of Rogue or Druid, for example, take a little bit too long with the decision making, and then right. suddenly the rope starts burning and then things get really dicey. And here's the important thing. He understood where his divergent paths were in the turn, right? A Gadgetan Auctioneer turn draws you so many cards. 
he knew he was starting his turn with prep that yeah, turn, like right? all the time. So he cast prep first. Now he's stopping to think after reacting to the draw as to how exactly he wants to navigate his way through this turn. A lot of players would have you know, paused to think over the whole turn at the start of the turn because classically that's what good practice in Hearthstone tells you to do. But the problem is when you're drawing cards over your turn, you need to be able to react to the extra cards that you draw. Yep. And is this... This is actually going to overdraw Viper, right? As if he's going to Fan of Knives this turn. I'm almost certain we're going to see a fan being used here. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know, this this was the big consideration, I guess, for Ikeel you, which, you know, he's prepped out the lower value spell here by using the prep on the Shiv and then following up with the Fan of Knives. So he's actually valuing burning one of his opponent's cards over saving himself one more mana with the preparation. But since he's just ended up with, a, with an Edwin Van Cleef turn here anyway, that's not a big deal. And... Am I seeing this right? Has Viper drawn through probably a good, what, 20 cards in his deck and we have not seen a Doomsayer yet? Yeah, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Unlucky. Yeah, this is rough. He does have a lot of freeze available, though, with two Blizzards and the Frost Nova Ooh, as well. Oh, 21. Good guess. Nice. Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't too bad. Pat myself on the back a bit. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you know, he's got a lot of freezes, so he can stall out, but also you've got the real problem of you do need to kill the board eventually, and we can see now with two questing adventurers yeah. available for, even if everything goes terrible for I kill you here and he loses the board, you just restack mm -hmm. it, and then Freeze Mage can't normally deal with these kinds of minions, you know, wave after wave, and he really just do, uh, does run out of resources pretty quick. Right, the problem here with like repeatedly freezing the board is that Two of his freezes are expensive, undiscounted blizzards. And when you play a blizzard, it's very hard to progress towards a win condition in the same turn. So I was just actually about to suggest this same play where Viper has to realize that now the moment has passed. The stalling plan is out the window. He needs to set up a win condition for himself. So I like him going down the burn plan here using the cheaper Frost Nova to set up some burn damage for himself and load up some card draw on the board. He's already sat with a Roaring Torch, a Fireball, and a Frostbolt in his hands. That's 15 less. more damage, plus an Ice Block he has for a guaranteed, draw, uh, guaranteed turn, plus Loot Hoarder on the board for almost a guaranteed <laughs> draw until your opponent very wisely saps it because you probably have a hard read right here that doomsayer even if it's in hand your opponent has understood that the the point of the game where doomsayer is going to be effective has long since passed so he understands that just denying card draw with the sap is first and foremost it and also the damage as well like you know the minions just chipping away suddenly at 22 this late in the game the just an extra two damage from nowhere can actually just be the difference between surviving a turn and not so yep. you know really really good play there with the sap from i kill you and look at that board extremely scary but viper does have the double blizzard but as you said it's going to slow him down a little bit but with the reduction on the ice block it means he can actually just squeeze in a ping which is another strategy you see a lot of freeze mage players using just every single ping to face if they're not planning on dropping alex Straza, which obviously viper doesn't have available at the moment every single ping to face matters yeah and again this is this is a concept that you know laughing talks about extensively yeah. laughing for those of you not familiar you know almost indisputably the best freeze mage player yeah. in the world it's good. It's yeah, he talks about the turn as freeze mage right and when it has passed when the time to interact with the board to clear your opponent's minions to stall for time when that moment has passed and when you have to go on the burn plan and i think viper recognized that turn pretty well this game yeah 100% because he has the second Roaring Torch as well in the deck yep. available, doesn't he? So suddenly that, you know, one draw can just really end the game for Viper here and get, get him that one win on the board as he has the second Ice Block. So as you said right at the beginning, a lot of the time Rogue has to try and kill the Mage three times and that is extremely difficult to do. He does have the minion base to do it, but does he have the time? It's a good question, and one Ice Lance was burned from that turn for, uh, by Aikilu, where he chose to go with the Fan of Knives uh, after the Shiv to draw the extra card, so um, the burn potential is lowered a little bit, as now, finally, we see that Doomsayer that Viper would have liked to have had several turns ago, but now that is just a whiff. He just wants to draw burn from his deck every single turn. He can only stall for so much longer here. He has another Blizzard to protect his first Ice Block for another turn if he wants to. Um, but he might just decide that the, the winning play is just to go here and try and pick up damage out of his deck. Doesn't play Pyroblast in the list, so there's not too much of a consideration of, of mana efficiency. Yeah. Because it's not like, you know, you're going to draw a 10-mana burn spell and you need to have all your mana available to fire it. 
Um, so I think he can afford one more stalling turn here, which I think is what we're going to see him go for. I think because he can play the loot holder right. and, and ping, and ping as face, well, yeah. that seems very efficient. And the odds on like your opponent sapping the loot holder again, well, that naturally makes their turn a little bit worse. He's actually going to ping his own loot oh, holder to play around okay. the sap here, and he picks up the Ice Lance. So he now has 19 damage in his hand. The two six damage burn spells, Frostbolt, Ice Lance. So he's up to 19 here. 19 plus two pings is 21, and he has two pings worth of turns here because he has two ice blocks. Yeah, and like, like we said, that's pretty much if the mage can get hold of those ice blocks and you know, steady themselves onto the board, that's a very good way to win this matchup. And why Rogue suffers, as we mentioned? Yeah, but uh, Aikiliu is going for a push here with the Leroy Coldblood of this play and with the Deadly Poison. He is going to pop. I 100% agree with this line because he can't give his opponent a free turn off the ice block. The unfortunate side effect is that he is just dead to the whelps <laughs> on board. So the winning line in most worlds just unfortunately ends up I kill you, uh, losing the game here for I kill you if I've counted this correctly, which it looks like I haven't unless Viper's miscounting. Oh, hang on. He just stopped after the ice block. I was like, let me just do the damage. I'm pretty here. sure that's 21. 6, 12, 15, 19, 21 by my count. Yep. That's without counting a ping because you can't, right? Right. Yeah. Oh. Okay, guys, we need a recount just to make sure. Fireball is six. Roaring Torch is six. That's 12. Frostbolt is 15. 19. Ice Lance is 19. Yeah. Plus Dominion attack. Three mana, six mana, seven mana, eight mana. Hmm. Pretty confident. Yeah, so am I now. Right. I'm, I'm going to join you in this. Okay. Yeah, that's a kind of a rough one from Viper actually just missing his chance at closing the game out this turn. But he has it in the bag anyway. Yep, does have the game locked up overall, so it's not going to cost him. Um, I do definitely agree with the line that I kill you took here. He was running out of time as well, just in terms of cards left in his deck. So, you know, he definitely had to make the push for several reasons. But yeah, Viper going to find himself over the line. I here. think he fell into the trap of, I have a guaranteed win this game. Yeah. And I'm going to play that, you know, play that out regardless of anything else. Right. So, you know, the two whelps isn't something that comes up too often. But Viper does get a point on the board versus I kill you. So he is now battling back. We will not see a 4-0, but stick around, guys. We'll be back with the next game of this series very soon. Uh, so tell me a little bit about what you do outside of Hearthstone. What you, when you venture out into the, the real world. I love rock climbing. Uh, I, I like to say a lot as well. So sailing is sort of a unique hobby. Uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of new to it, but uh, my friend uh, invited me on a trip with other people from my uni university. It was probably the best holiday vacations of my life. What makes it so great is that you live in a kind of symbiosis with other people and everyone is helping each other and doing everything together. So in the evenings, you, can, you just hang out by the campfire and uh, sing songs and just have a great time. Uh, some of them uh, are not that familiar with esports scene, so they just support what I am doing. It's great that I can count on them and uh, what can I say? I am lucky guy. <laughs> yeah. I kill you the team player by the looks of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know he actually, again, I was speaking to him yesterday and he's actually talking about how much he's practiced, you know, with his team and, and with his practice partners in terms of just full preparation for this. So really, uh, really going all out in this tournament. Yeah, and the polar opposite to Viper, <laughs> right? Who, you know, self-confessed self, self -confessed is, is a lone wolf. He doesn't really have a practice group that he practices with. You know, he plays a ton and he practices and he's, he's grinded out his preparation for this tournament as much as anyone, but he's doing it alone. And, you know, I begged the question before, is that is that what's responsible for, for some of these these tech choices and, and weird archetypes that he's brought here? Does he does he not have that, that friend just to pat him on the shoulder and say, Dude, uh, th th dude this, <laughs> this probably isn't the correct build of Rogue. That's, that's your job for me, Sol. Yeah, it is, you're right. <laughs>
It's definitely how our relationship works. But we did just see him put a point on the board versus I Kill You with the Freeze Mage. Yeah. Bit of a rough matchup overall for I Kill You. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it would have been cool to see the, the Welp team. I know! I feel like it's nice. been robbed away from me. <laughs> I wanted those Welps pushing in for the 20 and 21st point of damage. But looks like we are ready to Ooh. get back into it. And there you go. That is a three mana 4-3 that makes your hero immune. Violet Illusionist in Rogue. And I spoke to Viper about this card. It was pretty much the first question I asked him. I sat down and said, hey, good to meet you. My name's Sotl. So what's up with Violet <laughs> yeah. Illusionist? Gets to, um, cut to the chase. Like. So you know, the way he described it, he says, you know, he's not running questing, which most people are these days. And he wants to play Rogue in a more tempo-oriented fashion. Um, and the only way that Questing Adventurer, again, in his words, is strong as a tempo tool early in the game is if you have the hand where you have like backstab and a prep and another spell. His argument is if you play any minion plus backstab plus prep plus another spell, you are winning. So it doesn't matter too much what that minion is in that situation. So he likes Violet Illusionist for the utility of being able to trade into Dragon Warrior min minions, you know, Deadly Poison and, and SI7 Agent down a 5-4 or something without taking too much of brutality. And um, healing is something that has been cut from Rogue consistently over the last few tournaments that we've seen. So having that kind of, quote, healing effect in your deck, I can understand the validity of it, but I'm super excited specifically that we're queuing into a mirror match here because we do get to very directly, you know, compare the tech card choice up against the questing adventurers that I kill you is playing. Yeah, what worries me in general about the Illusionist is I completely understand Viper's logic, you know, as you would quite rightly explain there, but in, in like a control meta, like there's not that much stuff you're gonna want to trade into right. anyway and actually kill. In like if you're expecting full aggro lineups or at least half aggro lineups, and yeah, you know, I can get on board with that as an idea, but I feel like questing overall is just too strong. Yeah, um, but no matter what three mana card or three mana minion you're choosing to put into your deck, Coin Tomb Pillager wins a lot of games. So that is a very nice draw for Viper here, being able to develop the first minion on board here, get the initiative, and I kill you doesn't really have too much of a nice answer. He's actually going to prep Sap here. This is actually strong recognition. Tomb Pillager, probably the best Sap target in the entire deck. And um, particularly, apart from Edwin Van Cleef, which you know doesn't always have a huge impact on the game, in terms of just a vanilla minion, Tomb Pillager is such a great tool, and you're going to see Viper saying, do you know what? I agree with that line of play. I will do the same. Yeah, that makes sense. And th this kind of play as well was exactly what I saw from I Kill yesterday. He was very much just about denying the, the other rogue mm -hmm. in the matchup and just say, you know, if you get too many minions on the board, you lose. Yeah. If, if you get too minions to stick, then you probably just, you know, if your opponent gets two minions to stick, sorry, you probably just lose in this matchup overall. So kind of cool to see Viper just do the complete mirror play. Now I Kill You does develop the Thanos. He just gets the re dagger up for good measure there. And second Auctioneer being picked up. The prep being used on the previous turn. Definitely necessary just for tempo reasons, but does leave him a little bit short More being able to conceal his gadgets and Auctioneer. And here we see the competitive debut of Violet Illusionist with the spectacular effect of healing Viper for one. Okay, just means he's still ahead on health. You know, he's just going to keep, keep that health total. Yep. It's going to be really good there, just saving one damage. And also, Thank to be fair, there's a 4-3 he's got to deal with, but you know what's really good at do dealing three damage? The rogue weapon with deadly poison. Um, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say I am yet to be convinced by Violet <laughs> Illusion. I'm going to need a little bit more. Hey, sometimes you just got to dagger into those Thanos it's and then true. not take any damage. It's true. Okay, so I kill you. Does look like he's starting to get ahead on the board. He's behind on cards. Obviously, Viper does have that coin as well, and the conceal with the gadget Zan, so really good for Viper so far. But I kill you has the minion on board, and that minion's a Tomb Pillager. A minion is a Tomb Pillager, and that's a huge threat. And you know, very, very often, you know, this matchup used to be very, very combo focused back in the pure Miracle Rogue days. But as time's gone on, you know, Auctioneer and Leroy have got nerfed, and more powerful tempo minions like Tomb Pillager has been introduced to the deck. So quite often, this mirror match now gets decided less often by who gets the huge combo turns and draws their deck, and more often by who can get ahead on tempo and then just jam cold blood on something and conceal it, right? And just you know, attack face twice with a, with a Tomb Pillager hitting for nine or something. So. I kill you being the first person to really stick a minion here means that he has a chance in this game, even though Viper looks to be in a far superior position with the concealed auction. Yeah, and I kill you has the opportunity this turn to just completely ignore everything. Not that he can really interact with the gadgets and his stealth anyway, but gadgets and into cold blood. 
on the Tomb Pillager and just smack him in the face is definitely a good option to go with and really get aggressive. But doesn't like I kill you disagrees and sign up his Tomb Pillager zone means he's got potential of actually just having uh, two coins available to him and obviously the SI draw makes him be able to really just work that turn in a lot smoother. Yeah, I don't mind this. I think he really wants to pair that Cold Blood with a Conceal. He doesn't just want to expose the minion to only attacking once. I think he realizes that he is, you know, he's on the race plan. He has to be. He's down on cards. You know, he's, he's going to be facing an incredibly destructive turn here after the Gadgetzan Conceal. So I think he understands that his line here is just to bank a Cold Blood and Conceal seal the minion and hope that he can push through the damage that way. Yep. Viper has the opposite problem of now he's actually got a lot of options and continual card draw from the gadgets and as well. So he has the at least more complicated turn to deal with and his plan is going to be a lot more fluid depending on what he draws into. It's not great clear, is it? It's just not lining up too perfectly. Would have loved a backstab to go along with all this. So I'll lead out with the Eviscerate here. But for example, Fan of Knives just doesn't really have mm -hmm. too big an impact on this board. So I'm going to go ahead and use both Eviscerates instead. Slap down the uh, remaining 3-3 with his Deadly Poison, most likely. Be able to push four to face with the Auctioneer. But that is actually a fairly underwhelming cycle turn for a Concealed Auctioneer with all of your mana available. Yeah, very minion heavy. And for the following turn, suddenly Auctioneer doesn't look too amazing like unless there's a good fan target because also with that many minions you don't really want to just fan for the fun of it either oh baby this game is going off this is going to come down to just the next couple of draws from both of these players i kill you is going to need to pick up some extra damage off these gadgets and cycles like i said he has that cold blood available to him that he can now bank on a concealed oh. minion edwin is huge but he can't he just misses out on being able to conceal the edwin as well by one mana which would have been just an insanely huge swing on the board an immediate threat of lethal and all the violet illusionists in the world would not <laughs> have saved him from that much damage the following turn. No, that would have been pretty incredible, actually. Now I can just stop going, oh, uh, <laughs> like, okay, what is the game plan now as SI7 agent, again, because of the conceal, won't actually be protected in any way. Do you actually just go for the cold blood this turn? That's the scary problem here. I mean, I think this is the line he's considering. He's trying to work out, you know, what is higher win rate between a, just a huge Edwin Van Cleef right now, uh, si 7 to take damage and cycle off the board and just, you know, jamming the cold blood and trying to draw more cycle tools and push through my deck this turn. He decides that just limiting the card draw options for Viper is the best plan. And with the prep being picked up, that looks like a decision which might put him in pretty a pretty strong position here because with Leroy in hand for Viper, he would not have needed to cycle too much to, to pick up the extra damage he needs to push through. Yeah, there's already two Eviscerates gone for Viper, but mm -hmm. there is Cold Bloods knocking around, is. which it would have just been game if he'd drawn into it. Yeah, so now awkward position for Viper because if he wants to play the Auctioneer here to start cycling this this preparation and fan again, that means that he's he's pretty much locked out from any possible lethal, more or less, having spent too much mana to then commit Leroy. So again, this, this game is just on a knife edge. And like I said, with that Conceal being picked up on the previous turn, it was going to come down to the wire. Both of these players now have the opportunity to, to make the push with a conceal. Uh, but as I pointed out early on in the game, it's just I kill you has got to do it first, which leaves him in, in a pretty solid position. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the idea now that I kill you is in a, or well, was in a good position, but he, he is behind on health. And now Viper's pretty much just setting himself up for lethal next turn because just that slight health difference, that one point of damage. Right, so saved. now. I kill you, I kill you needs to go and he needs to find that card there, Leroy Jenkins, which his deck just kindly presents to him on the first attempt. So this is now 14 damage, three mana available. He has one more cycle to pick up Eviscerate or Cold Blood number two. This draw is huge. That is a whiff. And that is going to most likely be the game going to Viper, who's going to now square up the series. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, especially with the um, the uh, the conceal having to come out beforehand. Doesn't mean he can even just hope to, to leave right. the Leroy on the board and try and just kill him next turn. So it's going to be looking pretty rough with the Leroy there. It's easy, lethal for Viper, and he evens the match up at 2-2 in the Rogue Mirror. How important was the one damage saved? So you've got to think about it. Entirely irrelevant. you got to think about it. Think about it. Just think about it. TJ will be thinking about it right about now. He will. But yeah, Viper has evened it up 2-2. Two, two. So stick around, guys, and we will continue with the match soon.
do you do anything with mathematics outside of Hearthstone? Yeah, I'm going to start studying mathematics like next month. I really like it. <laughs> what do you want to do with mathematics? I'm really not sure yet because uh, studying will take basically at least five years to get my master, obviously. And after that, probably I'm, I can think of um, going to my own business. So you like business? Yeah, my dad got his own business running when I was three, four years old. Since of that, I already liked mathematics, liked uh, statistics. Mostly, when running your own business and stuff, you have to at least think of a risk. Sometimes it is really, really low and sometimes it's really big. So I liked it and I really tried to do it in games and there's something you can. I have a proposition for you. This blazer, okay? Okay. In like two years, I'm gonna be probably the most famous Hearthstone player or caster, I haven't decided yet. So if you buy this blazer off me now, it's only gonna appreciate in value, right? Sounds like a plan, but okay. I don't believe you. So $300, <laughs> it's a steal. Uh, no, I cannot believe you, sorry. <laughs>Tj always good for jokes. Is Tj getting too big for his boots these days. You give him all these extra jobs, like interviewing players, and you know suddenly he thinks he's just such a big deal. I mean, he gets his own table over on the other side. I know. You, sh you should see his rider for this event. His list of demands for things that have to be back. So he's just such Ludicrous. a di such a diva these days. Unbelievable. <laughs> no, but we are back with the fifth game. It is two two between I Kill You and Viper. And uh, Viper talk about there, you know, really into maths, which mm -hmm. is a pretty pretty reasonable thing to be good at if you're going to play Hearthstone. It's it's definitely not going to be a handicap. And yeah, he was he was talking about, you know, statistics particularly and risk assessment and probability. And, you know, that is um, a, a huge asset in Hearthstone. You know, we've seen in a lot of these these interviews, you know, TJ asking the question to people of, you know, are you a risky player or are you a, a conservative player? And, you know, risk, having a good understanding of probability and statistics, you know, puts you in a position where you can almost take that question out of the equation. And it's not a matter of risky or conservative anymore. It's just a risk. It's just a matter of the highest win rate play on each yeah. possible turn. So, yeah, but you do start the next game, Viper on the Druid versus I kill you on the rogue again. So we continue to see I kill you's rogue try and get that win he needs to continue on to the series and potentially win it. But Viper playing the Druid as well. And uh, I'm kind of, I don't know what you think about this matchup because you've been playing a lot of Druid very recently, but I feel like the rogue can actually just be too fast for the Druid to yeah, deal I, with a lot of the time. <laughs> I, I really don't like this matchup. I find it very, very unpleasant. I think one of the ways I've been most successful playing this matchup from the Druid side is just very spell heavy early game hand into cheap Arcane Giants because that's the one threat that they can't really interact with with their deck. You know, if you play a, an Arcane Giant for two or three mana or less, and their answer to that is sap. But okay. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Like, go nuts, buddy. That's crazy. You know, as long as they don't develop some huge tempo turn with a Van Cleef at the same time or a questing adventurer, then it's not really a big deal. But the mere fact they have the potential to do that is one of the big reasons why this matchup is so difficult, because they can swing the board so easily, and then Druid really struggles to, to fight their way back on. Yeah, but Vipers have got off to a quick start here as he's managed to actually get out, and as your Drake did mm. innovate it out which means he missed one mana off the, the full, you know, straight up innovate there. Yeah. But I do like getting the minion ahead of the rogue, because as we said, like, if rogue gets a couple of minions down early, gets the tomb pillager down, then I feel like druid falls into the trap of always being on the back foot, trying to you know, deal with the rogue minions, and then it just very swiftly gets out of control. And I kill you going with the Van Cleef over the SI7 agent to clear. That's an interesting choice. It is. And I think what I kill you's plan is here is if this thing lives, Guess what's happening? Cold blood jammed on there. Go to the face, conceal. He can even just questing conceal and conceal both yeah, that's minions what I was thinking, and then yeah. still have the cold blood available. So I definitely don't mind this push. This is you know one of those situations we talked in in the previous matchups where sometimes your highest win rate line with this deck does look quite all in, but you know sometimes it pays off very very rapidly. And I think this, a lot of the time it pays off. Actually, yeah, this, <laughs> this is a deck that is better equipped than most other decks in Hearthstone at cashing in on those all in situations. Yeah, since Quest Adventure became a, a staple, I would say in Rogue, there are so many games I've watched cast that pretty much go Quest Adventure with Van Cleef Conceal, and then their opponent just sits, looks at the screen for a minute or two, and then realizes he cannot do anything about this and dies. 
It's a Nightbane Templar from the Mulch. That is a Dragon Synergy card. 2-3 that summons two one ones if you have a Dragon in hand. Of course, I Kill You does Thank have some you. Azure Drakes in his deck, so he can potentially get some use out of that. But it's uh, a card that's a little bit exposed to swipe, even if you do come out with it. So against Druid, probably not the best pickup. Yeah, really not too great. Not, not to the extent it could be. We've seen a Tyrion today from Mulch, so... What if the mulch gave him a Violet Illusionist? Oh, think Vi about it. <laughs> Viper would just accuse him of copying. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like don't use my tech card. It's only me. So we see the Azure Drake obviously challenging the Tomb Pillager, but the idea for I Kill You is he just, you know, he needs to play a minion to start trying to beat this board back down, and he gains the coin even if it's cleared up. But Viper has a very easy answer in the form of the swipe. Does mean he can only follow up with a hero power uh, this turn. Well, could moon five face, but probably not not the great uh, great play there. But he does have nourish if he just wants to actually just cycle through his deck. Yeah, I think he's just doing various combinations of, of arcane giant maps here as to how each play influences what turn his arcane giant is going to come out. Decides that nothing really changes the clock in a, in an enticing way and just goes ahead with that with the swipe plan as you suggested. See, I kill you now not actually having too many great options to deal with this as your Drake outside of having to face tank it, which kind of feels terrible. Here we go. It's time to make the push. Yeah, this is it. He's got cold blood. Yeah, He's not got much good. else. He does have the uh, the conceal for the following turn, of course, if the questing survives. And to be fair, I kill you. He's just seen a swipe. Yep, mulch used, swipe used, and there is no answer in hand here. Even Nourish cannot pick up, or it could. It could pick up a Wrath, which he could then pair with the Moonfire in his hand if he wants to go for the all-in play of uh, Nourish to cycle here. But Do you feel like you have to do that, though, because you can you just leave a questing on the board. You do have Yogg. It's not a big Yogg at all. It's a four spell Yogg right now, as you can see from the, the handy arcane giant counter, but it's it might be enough for, you know, it might be enough of an upside to pull you away from the absolutely miserable feeling play of just trying just to draw, it, yeah. draw exactly for a wrath. So, I mean, it, it's it's tough. It's, think, it's really tough. I think the issue as well is, uh, let's be honest, uh, any other option doesn't really feel great for Viper here either. Agreed. If, if he nourishes into cards, great. He has two mana and maybe he gets the Wrath and then, you know, everything's looking a little bit better now. But, you know, just Violet Teacher, Moon, yeah, moon Fire more, Hero Power doesn't feel great. Yeah, so. I think the more I look at it, the more I think you have to. I just, I, I don't see he, a particular Even without the Wrath, like, I think it's the right he's play. Going to oh. He's going to ramp Violet Teacher and Moonfire here. Wants so to play he, that Yogg. So he is just going to, he's on the Yogg plan here. He's just yoding up, loading up the Yogg. But even now, after all those spells being committed, this is only a six spell Yogg. So it is a big ask, particularly because Yogg Saron does not interact with concealed minions. It obeys targeting laws. Yeah, that's kind of nuts, actually, because it means, but also it's a little bit scary because if he plays Conceal, all his minions will be stealthed. Yeah. And I kill he's only on 14. So there's that's always true. something to consider where any any burn spell that doesn't hit Viper's own minions mm -hmm. are just going to automatically hit I Kill You. Yeah, so I, I think I Kill You's job here is to get his questing adventure, at least the first one, out of the range of high damage AoE spells. So Flame Strike, if you can get it up to five health, you should feel relatively secure. And then you're asking for some insanity with, you know, Twisting Nether, Doom, or you know, some buffed up Shadow Flame, for example, yeah. to try and take care of it. So. I definitely like this line, and I kill you, I'm sure, smells that it is Yogo Clock <laughs> from Viper right now, so I'm 100% confident that Conceal is coming. Yeah, with what was followed up there from that Nourish ramp, then, you know, there's very limited options going straight into turn 10. Pretty much the play, and we'll see how fast I kill you actually does just play Yog. He's going to put the attacks in first, which is something that he's talked about quite often. His in hero the power of is live, so one of his spells, there you go, straight away is wasted on an Innovate. Those are whiffs 10. Uh, oh. 10 health on, on I Kill You's Rogue right now, so Pyroblast is live. Two of that damage, damage done with Head Crack. Lay on hands, even if it hits his own face, is probably not going to be enough. And I think we are very rapidly running out of spells here, Raven. There you go, that was yeah. the last one. Too small. 
just too small, and that is two questing adventurers sat on the board right now getting buffed up and just concedes the damage is in play already to kill him. I kill you does pick up the win with the rogue at the third time of asking now, I believe. Yeah, and again, we just see the power of questing adventurer overall and why we were a little bit worried about Viper's deck choice in terms right. of not including it, because sometimes it just does that. So I kill you is 3-2 up, only needs to win one more game. So stick around, guys. We'll be back with the next game soon. Uh, what's the Hearthstone community like in Poland? Most of the people are really passionate about it. Uh, and uh, as, as you mentioned, Nimes, uh, he's always doing his best for the Polish community. We had Loyan, as you mentioned, in the spring. We had uh, my teammate uh, A8 in the top 16 in winter. So, uh, do you practice a lot with your team? They help me a lot during the uh, preparation time. I have really good uh, support from the team and uh, they know they can count on me as well. It's really nice. Do you think it's important and a big advantage to have players to talk to about the game? Uh, it's definitely a huge advantage because some other players can have different insight on the plays, on the event deck list, which you might have not even considered before. Uh, if you won the championship, would maybe more teams and sponsors start looking at some Polish Arsenal players a little bit more? Uh, I definitely hope. Uh, I am pretty satisfied uh, with my uh, current team, but other players should be able to showcase their skills as well. So it would be great if other teams uh, also emerged uh, and invested in Polish players. you singing the praises of his team and practice partners. Can't really argue with it so far in terms of just getting to top eight is an achievement in itself. Yeah, it definitely is. And again, it, it comes down to the, the difference in the, in the preparation for these two players, right? I kill you very, very clearly saying there, you know, the outside perspective is really useful to me because, you know, there's something I might have missed. It's just a different set of eyes that looks in the game, looks at the game a different way. And, you know, Viper himself is, is just in a in a one man practice group, you know, grinding out to himself, which you know, is, is an incredible testament to him, honestly, that he's managed to get this far without the assistance of, you know, one of these high level practice groups. But he is going to need to make that extra push. And we are back to one of the, the most controversial decks in the tournament, the Dragon Control Warrior that is going to have to come down against this aggro shaman from Aikilu. Yeah, and uh, I was speaking to Aikilu and he was talking about the, the shaman list he chose, like aggro over mid-range, mm -hmm. and it's the one he took by far the most flack on. He, he A lot of the, the, some of the pro scene he talks to, you know, outside of his team, and they, maybe even some of the players here were saying, well, why didn't you just bring mid-range? Because, what? you know, there's quite a, a surge of oh. the power of the mid-range shaman deck at the moment. And he, he just said, well, yeah, I just think aggro is just better overall as opposed to trying to target any specific matchup. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, as time has gone on, people are starting to appreciate the, the mid-range shaman list a lot more. And it's, it's by far the more common variant on ladder right now, for example. But there is still a place for just hitting your opponent in the face really, really hard. Over and over <laughs> again. Repeatedly <laughs> until they explode. Yeah, and the in interesting uh, card in this deck, or at least one of them, is the Earthshock inclusion. Yes. Because suddenly, you know, these big taunt dragons that, that we've been looking at in Viper's deck and the chance to discover, you know, not Chilmars, for example, mm -hmm. can just be negated right at the, you know, the, the back end of the game where uh, Kill you just needs to finish up and then he just presses Earthshock for one mana and carries on. And again, another consideration in these tournament lineups that you know, make, make, makes you think these players have considered that they are going to come up against some very well-known Freeze Mage players in this tournament, right? Like, Doomsayer is going to lock you out of the game, so packing an extra Earthshock in your deck is a very big deal, as well as dealing with potential huge what taunts, as you no. said. The, the Chilmores in this case, but perhaps more commonly Ancient of War would be what it's being targeted at. Um, but it will uh, remain to be seen whether it's going to have a huge impact in this matchup or whether it'll be, you know, kind of a whiff draw where he would have liked to draw a, a second Argent Horse Rider, which is basically what it's replaced directly yeah. in the deck by looking at it. Yeah, we see now Viper is actually, you know, starting on the game plan of trying to just control and slow this Shaman down, just using raw minion power 
because he did just use an execute to kill off one and then just relying on these minions to get even more value. And he picked the hungry, uh, hungry dragon up from the nether spike, which kind of feels like an awkward pickup. It was a pretty awkward discover. The other two were, uh, you know, nine mana cards, which you, you, <laughs> just, you just don't want to pick a nine mana card in this matchup. So even though hungry dragon is a little bit awkward, it's probably just the play here because even if, say, a 2 1 or a dust devil were to come out here, he still has the superior trade and just leave the 1 1 up on the board. So he actually engineered a nice situation for his hungry dragon here. But this is a pretty oppressive looking shaman hand here for Aikiliu. 7-7 seven, seven into Doomhammer obviously cannot be played in consecutive turns, but having the threat of both of them over the course of the game is one of the big keys to beating up control decks. And then he has just a pile of damage behind that to back it up with the rock by a weapon and the two lightning bolts at a minimum, plus anything else that he draws. Yeah, we know, you know, we can see that it's almost like just a two to three turn plan to win the game already from I right. Kill You, and it's completely on Viper to stop that happening. He doesn't really have too many good options at the moment. The Shield block is available for Cycle and some additional armor gain. But other than that, is you know, his hand's looking pretty lackluster to try and you know defend against this board as a or sorry, this uh this onslaught I kill you is gonna present him with. There's Nether Spike not gonna do too much. He's pretty much just all in on this 5-6, just getting work done. He is, yeah. And from from my kill you's perspective, he the 7-7 seven seven looks appealing from where we are because we can see no answer, but he's really really taking his time here because he's considering the implication of something as simple as you know, Blackwing Corruptor which then suddenly is a huge tempo swing right now punishing the overload of the 7-7 and creating the trade on the board but just looking through his hand there just isn't really an ulterior plan to that right apart from develop your huge minion try and get it to connect face and then try and back that up with the damage that you have yeah and the benefit is he has seen one execute as well so at least you know there's one of those really uh, like shut down cards as he executed a Feral Spirit okay. earlier on. So at least you know that the hard punish is kind of, you know, or well, at least one of them is gone from mm -hmm. the deck so far. And now Viper's going to choose whether he actually wants to try and just commit to a brawl here. It's not a terrible brawl, honestly. It's it's 66% to you know stop that 7-7 seven, seven from hitting you in the face, which is more or less the only thing you care about right now. If the 1-1 one, one wins, that's kind of a win for you. No big deal. Um, and I, I, I definitely don't hate it. It's a, it's a very, very, you know, it's a gambler's decision in this situation. But again, we've, we've talked about this several times during this series. You know, sometimes, you know, thinking about something as risky or conservative isn't quite the way to do it. It's just, is this my highest win rate line? And Viper looks like he's going to take a slightly more conservative plan here. He definitely doesn't know that the opponent's hand is just packed full of damage right now. And exactly how punishing <laughs> this 7-7 connecting with face can be. And he's also going to get punished by leaving up the 1-1 one, one here, which now gets to connect for additional damage, or in fact, take out the 5-6 here and leave his uh, his now 9-7 in complete dominant control of the board. Yeah, the idea is if you didn't kill it last turn and you played the minion, you're not going to kill it this turn, more than likely. Right. And then this is kind of crazy. Nine damage straight into the face there. And we can see Doomhammer rock by a rock by a lightning bolt to follow up the next two turns. Yep, only going to have five available to him on the next turn. So he overloaded for one with the Lightning Bolt on that turn. So we will probably just be seeing the Doomhammer turn come up. But then from his perspective, he's swinging in two more with the Doomhammer, putting his opponent down to 15. And then he has double Rottweiler and Lightning Bolt for lethal, which, you know, if Viper doesn't gain more life than just his hero power gain during that time, he is just dead. But with the benefit of Caster Vision, there is 10 additional life gain in Viper's hand, which has something to say about that. Yeah, I think the frustration is, though, with no shield slams, the shield blocks, like, yes, they extend life, but you can't really, you know, bank on the armor to be able to help remove this 7-7. Seven, seven. But hey-ho, you just play the brawl and win. And yeah, this mean Viper's feeling much better about this game so far. But Snap Doomhammer, not too much of a surprise, especially because the thing from below is currently sat at five mana. I kill you hasn't bothered with that, those silly totems this game. It's just been face or nothing. Yeah, and you know that decision to brawl that turn, you know, it's, it's a gamble, as we said, but, you know, I question the decision of whether it was correct on the previous turn, in which case, you know, he'd have nine more life now, potentially with the same outcome. And even then, the 1-1 one, one surviving was a perfectly fine scenario. He goes ahead and uses both shield blocks immediately 
choosing to bypass the the armor gain here, which perhaps signals his his intention to just use that one turn to stabilize himself as hard as he can. And then on the following turn, this turn coming up now, he can start to make a more aggressive push and not have to worry about casting things like shield block. Yeah, so now this is a tough question for I kill you. Normally, or a lot of the time, you want to get in the, the rock biter damage ASAP to stop a taunt coming up. And But the only problem is maybe considering with this thing from below play is if you get the rock biter in now, and then he can just secure his armor, play, play a taunt and then armor up behind it, then the rock battery damage just doesn't feel quite as impactful. And well, there's another way to gain a lot of armor. Just a car, true heart is a very big deal here, but you know, Viper doesn't know it, but first and foremost is putting up a taunt right now because there is a ton of melee damage in hand with those rock bio weapons from Aikilu. So I, yeah, he, from, from our perspective, we know that taunting up here is first and foremost, but he is going to do no such thing. This he is, is just going to trade. address the board, and that is a miserable trade for him on the board. That, I believe, is just going to be the end of the wow. series. That's 16 damage from the Rock Biters, 19 from the Lightning Bolt, and 21 from that one copy of Argent <laughs> Horse Rider. It could have been an Earth Shot. But he Horse got the Rider. one he needed for that final two damage. And Viper, the Dragon Warrior, the unconventional Dragon Warrior, has come back to bite him in the end. Yeah, actually ended up going 0-3 in this match so far. So yep. unfortunate for Viper there, but congratulations to I Kill You. You played uh, extremely well there. Had a bit, had a cool matchup with the Rogue Mirror, which was definitely uh, awesome to watch. But I feel, I just feel like I Kill You's lineup overall was just, just screamed more power. Yeah, I think, I think it's just a product of, you know, a better practice environment. You know, I'm sure if Viper wants to push forward from here, he will, you know, pick himself up a practice group, perhaps with some people that he's met today, right? Yeah. He might be able, might, might be invited to, to push forward from here and get into a strong group where he can, you know, apply the Hearthstone hive mind because trying to fight these battles on your own is, is very, very difficult sometimes. Definitely, but congratulations again to I Kill You moving on and he's actually fireside with TJ for the winner's interview. That's right, guys. I'm joined by I Kill You, who's the winner of that last match. Uh, you, you said in your interview you had a little bit of obstacles getting here. How does it feel to come in and win your first match here? Mm, well, obviously amazing. Uh, one, one down, two to go, and let's just focus on the uh, sem semi-final with George. It will definitely be a really hard match. Uh, he's probably one of the favorites coming into the tournament, but everyone has equal chances, so it will, it, it will probably be a good show. Yeah, definitely. I think both of you guys are two of the favorites coming in, especially after those two matches. So good luck in that semifinal. I'll let you go uh, watch the matches and prepare. In the meantime, we're going to jump into the third quarterfinal match of the day. It's